that uh, discipleship, uh, what we're going to do at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we'll serve breakfast. Uh, amen. And so it'll be a wonderful, wonderful time at 11 o'clock is preaching the word of God. Uh, men from our churches all over the Ohio Valley will be here as far as Pittsburgh, uh, amen, to Cincinnati, to Dayton, Columbus, uh, and possibly West Virginia. Uh, we'll be here, uh, amen, to celebrate men's discipleship with us, all men. I'm asking you to take the time aside. It's only two hours, 10 o'clock to noon. Uh, on that Saturday, the 30th of January, uh, amen, uh, uh, you try hard, you can make it, and you'll have a blast. It won't cost you anything. Breakfast is free. I will take a, a, an offering for the preacher. Uh, Halloween will be Nick Half out of Cincinnati. So uh, we are excited about all of that, amen. Then next month, we'll do it again uh, toward the end of February. And, uh, and that will, of course, be uh, with Pastor Roger Williams out of Pittsburgh. And so we're going to have just a great time. Our men's discipleships are classic. They are amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a great time with them, and the preaching is just above. I, it's just amazing what, what, how God speaks to men. And so it's about making you a better man, a better husband, a better father, a better citizen, a better, uh, a better everything, amen, that is male. Uh, praise God. And so we're believing God for that. That's at the end of the month, uh, amen. Uh, also, we do have our nursery has begun, uh, and Sunday school will start next uh, for children. Uh, it'll be a children's church type of thing, and that'll be next Sunday morning, uh, starting uh, here uh, during our service, they'll be downstairs, and so we're excited about that. And so we are also um, uh, going to continue to uh, remodel the downstairs. You can see it looks great. A lot of things are done already. Uh, and so we've got uh, kitchens and bathrooms to do, and, uh, and et cetera. And so, but we will have the Sunday school room and the children's church ready uh, for next week. Nursery is already functioning right now, as you can tell, by the utter quietness. <laughs> Amen. In our service. Hallelujah. Uh, without screaming babies, trying to preach louder than I do. Amen. And so, it's a great, great, great time. So, we're excited to have all of you here. That's all the announcements I have. Uh, let's give the Lord praise. Our ushers would come. We want to take it off. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. All right, so God is good. Yes, he is. Amen. So we are going to give as the Lord will lead us to give. We're believing God. Uh, amen. Our Sunday morning services are by far larger uh, than our, our Sunday night or Wednesday night, but uh, uh, we're believing God that will even out as time moves forward. Because I believe in these last days. I believe in the days that we're living in. I believe in the crazy days, even, even moving up towards Wednesday of this week. I believe in the craziness of the times we live in. We need to, uh, uh, to uh, settle in our minds that serving the Lord is the most important thing in our lives. So we have to settle that in our minds. We have to get our hearts right. We have to render our uh, responsibility to the Lord. Uh, this church is open Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. If I were you, uh, uh, I would be at every one of them. Uh, amen. Uh, and so I want to tell you something. When I got saved and got in our fellowship in Anchorage, Alaska as a young military man, um, I went to every service. It was just automatic. In fact, I can count on one hand the number of services I've missed in 36 years. And not because somebody said, you have to go this, you have to do that, you have to do that. No, it was, uh, it was because I couldn't imagine the church being open, the, prep, the, the pastor preaching, and me not being there. It just didn't make sense to me. Why, why would I do that? I'm a Christian, born again. Let's do what God has called us to do. The same is true with giving. The same is true with a heart for uh, finances, for, for blessing the Lord. The same is true for you and I uh, to make a decision where our investment is will go where it matters, where it's going to make the biggest difference in the last days we live in. Let's give us a Lord who lead us to give him that. Uh, Brother Josiah, would you bless the offering? 
Amen. You want to give online, it's phohio.com. Uh, feel free to go there. To the button on the top of the page, online giving. time is coming. Amen? Uh, praise God. Pray. Continue to pray for musicians. Praise God. If you have your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, it seems like I can't write a message anymore uh, without considering what we're living in right now. Because I believe that these are perilous times. And I believe that there is so much about what's happening now in America that is written in the Word of God. That is a clear warning that this is what that would look like. The Bible says this is what the last days will look at like, and then it describes modern-day America right now. Amen. Generation gap has never been so defined as it is today in our almost insane society. Students can text message at alarming rates using abbreviations acronyms and code to create their own young people understanding of what is being said. Consider uh, uh, amen all that's happening around you and you can see that the technology age has d dynamically changed everything. It is given uh, you know the younger generation an edge and, and I know that, that uh, you know in my day and age we listen to rock and roll we you know we put our eight track tape in uh, into uh, you know uh, the tape player and listen to rock and roll and my parents uh, you know they were listening to Elvis and, and uh, some big band stuff and, and they didn't understand me and I didn't understand them but really they could still talk to me amen right uh, but they can't talk now it's like it's like things don't mean the same thing anymore we'll get to that in a moment perilous times are here Paul describes perilous times and the social condition of the last days. Let me read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, and just kind of grab a hold of this for a minute with me. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, Without self-control. How many's ever seen a generation that lacked self-control like this one? Mm, come on. <clears throat> Brutal. Despisers of anything good. 
traitors, headstrong, haughty, which means high-minded, arrogant, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying the power, uh, and from such people turn away. For this sort are those who creep into households. They make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away with various lusts, always learning, but never able to come to the truth. It says two things. Verse 5, they have a form of godliness, meaning they think they're righteous. They feel they're righteous. They, they, they act like they're uh, better than you. Right? But they deny the power of God. They deny that God is the source of their righteousness. Amen. They have a form of godliness. It seems like they're godly, but they're not godly. And they don't, and they deny God's power. And it says, from such people turn away. And then verse 7, they're always learning, but never seem to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the universities in today's day and age are absolute uh, havens for propaganda of anti-Christian uh, uh, generation. They, they, they hate God. They preach against God. If you're not an atheist, you're not enlightened Amen. in today's universities. They are always learning. Professors with PhDs and double PhDs, always learning, always learning, but never seem to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And I'm confronting in this message what every church and family confronts on a daily basis. They don't even know it. So you're never able to come to the truth. Not, they're never able to come to the truth. 2 Timothy 3, 7, always learning. Never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, no wonder. We are on different planets <laughs> of language and understanding among the generations. Many are unaware. I mean, I'll use illustrations here when I'm preaching about people that uh, I didn't think were that long ago. And the young people said, who's that? I talked to two people the other day that never heard of Elvis. Didn't know who Elvis was. I said, are you kidding me? You should be put in jail for not knowing who Elvis <laughs> That is just a crime. Oh, wow. I didn't bring their briefs. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. We're on different planets. Many are unaware of the differing definitions their kids apply to words and the false concepts these definitions lead them to adopt. Uh, it was just a few minutes into a song on the radio by Elvis, a Christmas song by Elvis, as I was trying to do my corny Elvis impersonation, which I don't do bad, uh, but I haven't done it in a while. And, and I was going at it for a while, thinking I was being funny, before I realized my grandchildren had zero idea who the guy was <laughs> and what I was doing. Uh, That's great. Many are unaware of the different definitions that their kids are applying to words and the false concepts these definitions lead them to adopt about life. Notice just a few words in our conversations with our children and young people that mean different things to this emerging generation. Let me just go through a couple of them. How about the word tolerance? Right? Uh, adults, me, uh, I'm an adult. Uh, 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 <laughs> Right? We're adults now, are we? Right? Uh, an adult, the common understanding and definition of the word tolerance is accepting others without agreeing with or sharing their beliefs or lifestyle choices, but accepting. We'll tolerate what they do. We don't have to agree with them, right? But we tolerate. We're not going to come against them. We're going, you know, whatever. They do what they do, and we tolerate that. Postmodern understanding, or this new generation's understanding, uh, is accepting that each individual's beliefs, values, lifestyles, truth claims are equal, regardless of basis or fact, with their own. So they think if you tolerate somebody, to have tolerance means you have to agree with what they're doing, what they're saying, who they are, in all detail, what they're doing, what they've chosen, one of the 64 genders they pick, whatever it is, their pronouns, that you have to agree with all of that, or you're not being tolerant. That's not what the word tolerant means. But that's what it means to the youth today. How about respect? How many have a pretty clear understanding of what respect means? Don does. He's the only one who raised his hand, so I'm, I'm going to go with Don. Respect. 
The adult meaning is giving due consideration to others' beliefs and lifestyle choices without necessarily approving of them. We're going to respect them, respect their choice. Uh, I, I don't agree with it, but I, I respect you enough uh, not to get in your face about it, right? Or, you know, or, or something like that. Amen. That's respect. We respect them because uh, they respect us, right? And so we, we get along. We get along with our neighbors because we respect who they are, uh, even though we don't agree with everything they do. Amen. Isn't that right? Okay. The the youth. The young people understanding of that, uh, including uh, my grandchildren learning as early as fourth and fifth grade, third grade, knowing and understanding words that I never knew till I was in college. All right? And so think about this for a moment. They think the word respect means wholeheartedly approving of others' beliefs or lifestyle choices. Wholeheartedly approving. If you're going to respect somebody, you have to approve of and agree with everything they do. Or you don't. you're not respecting them. That's what they believe. It is an all-in or none-in. Amen. How about the word acceptance? Adult understanding is embracing people for who they are, not necessarily for what they say or do. Uh, the young people understanding or the postmodern understanding is endorsing and even praising others for their beliefs and lifestyle choices. Uh, amen. That, that, that uh, on the front page uh, of Sports Illustrated could be a transgender woman that used to be uh, an Olympic man. Uh, uh, and and he, he gets the Hero of the Generation Award. A hero... For changing his gender. A hero. No, not, not a Marine that carried out 16 other Marines out of the battle and saved their lives. No, no, no. No, no. Somebody that changed their gender gets the hero of the, of the year award. So, I mean, that, and that's, that's kind of how they believe it. And so that would be uh, acceptance, endorsing and even praising others for their beliefs and lifestyle choices. Uh, uh, the, the next words would be moral judgments. Uh, adults say certain things are morally right and wrong as determined by God. Uh, the young people, postmodern understanding, we have no right to judge another person's view or behavior, and so we don't make moral judgments. That's what the generation growing up is. I, it, I, it, I'm not going to say they're right or wrong. That's whatever's good for them. Jesus. And that's a scary place to be. Because there are many of us that got saved because what we thought was good for us was not good for us. Amen. And so, uh, then personal preference. We believe it's a preference of color. I mean, I prefer blue over red. You know what I mean? Uh, food, clothing. You know, I, 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 you know, food. I like a good medium rare steak. Maybe you like it well. Uh, you know, which I, I don't think anyway. So uh, then there's clothing style, hobbies, pers you know, personally determined. These are your personal preferences. The young generation says a personal preference is a pre preference of sexual behavior, value system. Beliefs are personally determined. <clears throat> Personal rights. Adults say everyone has the right to be treated justly under the law. Postmodern understanding says everyone has the right to do what he or she believes is best for himself or herself, regardless of what's right or wrong, because there is no right or wrong. Freedom. Adults say being free to do what you know what you ought to do. Being free to do what you ought to do. Not do what you want to do. But real freedom is making you free to do what you want to do. What is right? Freedom in the postmodern generation is being able to do anything you want to do without consequences. Truth is the final word I want to look at today. Truth. The, uh, the common understanding is an absolute standard of right or wrong. That's what truth is. How many know truth is truth cannot change? Amen. Some things are either true or it isn't. Right. What color is the sky? It is blue. blue. Right. Who said green? <laughs> yeah. The bearded man. <laughs> <question. laughs> yeah. Sorry. He's not from our culture. So, <laughs> truth, an absolute standard of right and wrong. The postmodern understanding is whatever is right for you is your truth. 
We don't tell our stories anymore. We tell our truths. Right? What is the truth? A truth is a story that made you what you are. And so this, you, and I've dug into this. I'm not going to get into all of this today. Um, some of it we're dealing with on our Wednesday night, but I'm telling you, I've gotten into this, and it get, it is a rabbit hole you don't want to go down. I promise you. I promise you that the generation that's coming up has zero idea of why you believe what you believe because they don't even know the words that you're speaking. When you're talking to them, they're having completely different meanings. I was witnessing intensely to a homosexual that I was sitting at a table and we were good friends. He, he, cuts, he cut my hair when I was living in Zambia. And so we were talking and I was witness, telling him about the love of God and, 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 and all of this. And I, I went through all, just a whole litany of, of things and, and it looked like we were connecting and connecting well. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, when it was all said and done, I said, I said, so do you have any questions for me? And he goes, so do you think I should, do you think I should have the change? I said, yeah, I do think you should change. <laughs> he goes, oh, I've never heard a pastor say that. I said, you've never heard a pastor say you should change? He goes, yeah, most pastors say I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't become a woman. So I did, did I say you should become a woman? He goes, well, you said I should, I should change, yes. I said, no, no, that's not what I meant at all. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm lost. Did you just hear me over the last 20 minutes? <laughs> yes, I, I felt like you were telling me I needed to change. I said, we'll stick to haircuts in the future. <laughs> it was a very difficult conversation. Why is it that the vast majority of our own church kids, 65% by statistics, either believes or suspects that there is no way to tell which religion is true? These are Christian children in church. 65% do not believe uh, or they suspect there is no way to tell which religion is true. Because your kids and mine have been influenced to believe that Christianity can't be exclusively true. That trueness to a religion is based on the individual's preference. What they say they believe is true. You and I know that doesn't change who God is. And you can say that clock is my God and that doesn't make you a winner. Ever. That, that doesn't make that clock God. It doesn't matter what you say. Uh, amen. There is a God of heaven. You see, in your young people's minds, no one has the right to assert that one religion is better than another. They are taught and they have adopted the creed of the culture that says all beliefs are equal. And if you've heard people say before, well, as long as you believe something, no, no. Amen. Not it it matters what you believe. Yes, amen. Yes. It matters what you believe. Amen. And here we are. Consider the problem in our generation. Because in the absence, and this is why it's so important uh, to, to teach our children in the way that they should go. Amen. So that when they are old, they will not depart from it. And my kids uh, that are grown now, they might backslide, they might go run around, they might be howling at the moon, but they know what's right and what's wrong. And they'll never forget Amen. what's right and what's wrong. Yes. And when they're out there, they know intrinsically that they are lost, not just choosing their truth. Amen. They know they are lost and they need to get back. And what, in the back of their mind always, it wasn't Aaron's, it isn't Brianna's, in the back of their mind, through it all, they're thinking one day, I need to go back home. Amen. Home not being to where I live, but home being where God is God yeah. and Christ Amen. is your Lord and Savior. Amen. And that's exactly what they meant. But in the absence of foundational training, 
Our young people have been influenced by a philosophy that permeates much of our society, much of our government, schools, movies, television, music, even guides much of their behaviors without them even being aware of it. The, this extremely complex, often contradictory, the, the constantly changing school of thought that can be summarized as the belief that moral and religious truth does not exist in any objective sense. Instead of discovering truth, in a story such as in the Bible that presents a unified way of looking at life, postmodernism rejects any overarching explanation of what constitutes truth and reality. They don't even want to have one explanation for the universe. They are constantly learning. And, and, and right now, uh, the Bible says one thing that they used to reject 50 years ago. And now they're learning that as they learn more science, that science is now agreeing with what the Bible has said Amen. all along. They used to believe that the universe was uh, closing in on itself and that the universe was coming back together and that one day it would come back into this big energy mass uh, uh, and, 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 it would, and it would it would condense and condense and condense and then it would explode and that would be a big bang again and life would start over. That's what they used to believe, science. The Bible says, no, the universe is expanding. It's getting bigger. The universe is constantly expanding. It's, it's got stretching out the curtains of, he of heaven, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And now they've learned that the universe, guess what? It's expanding, just like the Bible said. I've got a whole list. If you ever want to see it, if you want a copy of it, if you're ever talking to anybody that believes, well, I believe in science. Well, let me tell you about science. Amen. I've got a whole four or five pages of things that science have discovered this generation that the Bible has known all along. Amen. 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 So, they believe that, that, that truth, whether in science, education, or religion, is created by a specific culture or a community and is true only in and for that culture. Of course, such a man as Paul is describing in Timothy regarding the last days have always existed. But when the depravity that he describes characterizes an entire society, that very well signals the approach of the end of the age. And I believe that we are there Amen. right now. Amen. We are at the end of the age. When the conditions prevailing today of selfishness, sexual perversion, crime, violence, lack of conscience, Rebellion against but, uh, uh, biblical morality are contemplated. One is not surprised that many Bible scholars view the, this modern society today as a doomsday society. Because we are flooded now with people who are not only uh, rejecting God, but they are feeling righteous in their rejection. They think if they believe in climate change, and you do not, although climate change changes daily, I don't know what those beliefs are. You know, it used to be a global cooling, the great ice age is coming again in the 70s, and, and we're all going to die. And, and then, it was, then it was, oh no, acid rain is going to come. Oh no, and we're all going to die. And then it was, oh no, the, uh, the, the ionosphere, uh, you know, and it's going to, you know, going to fall apart, and, you know, and, and it just keeps going. And now it's, you know, it, the earth is, is warming, and, and the oceans, you know, are going to... Uh, it's just another craziness. And so it's every 10 years, it's something new. But if you don't believe in climate change, then you are not righteous. And they believe you to be a stupid, ignorant uh, uh, Trump supporter or something, some fool. And, and, they, they, and so they feel righteous. There are now ladies that have had abortions, that have killed a baby in their womb that are holding up a sign saying, I've had three abortions and I'm proud of them. I have no regrets. And they're standing out on the street to show the world that they are righteous in their choice not to bring a child into a society like this where it can't be raised properly because there's no school lunches for preteens. This is the generation we live in. You're going to have to uh, bear with me tonight. Amen. I am definitely on a pedestal tonight. I'm on a pulpit tonight. 
this is this is where we are having a form of godliness but denying its power Amen. Uh, uh, there are people that will try to make me feel bad for being a Christian <clears throat> because as a Christian I'm intolerant I'm patriarchal right white religion Oh, it's everywhere. It, it is at 2 Timothy 3, 5, having a form of godliness, denying its power. Uh, a, a suicide prevention hotline gets hundreds of suicide letters every month. 50% of those are from professing Christians. Professing Christians in our generation are, are, are calling suicide hotlines. 50%. Jeremiah 17, verse 5 through 9. Thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. He won't even know when something good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, uh, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, uh, and desperately wicked. Amen. Who can know it? Amen. Your heart is a liar. Amen. Yeah. Your emotions are liars. They will lie to you. How do I know? Because I've listened to mine. Yeah. Amen. 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 And I used to run around like a banshee howling at the moon. I understand what that's like. It's funny because my friends called me crazy then. Guess what? My friends call me crazy now. Amen. Same friends. Amen. <laughs> Only now I'm crazy because I got born again and I left that life. Oh, come on. Right? And some of them are, are 58 years old as well without uh, families. Uh, and their lives are a mess. Uh, homeless alcoholics. Amen. And they call me crazy. Amen. Because I live for God. I've had the opportunity to reach the world for Jesus. I've preached in 26 nations. I've pioneered a church in a third world country. I've got people all over our church Facebook page uh, from all over the world constantly checking in. And they call me crazy Amen. because we're reaching the world for Jesus Christ. Amen. Shocking. Why do we as Christians not tell people that God can help them? Why don't we tell them? Why do we always seem to push problems off on the professional? Those with degrees. Divorced people that are marriage counselors with a, with a big degree on the wall. For a Christian to say there is no help for them is to say that either God is not capable of helping them or that he does not really care enough to help them. Amen. Which is it? Is God not able to help us? Or are we not worth his time? Which one is it? See, this person goes so far as to say she does, uh, uh, does not care if she goes to hell. I've heard that many times. Uh, witnessing the people, uh, you know, the Bible says if you're not saved, on your way to hell, I don't care if I go to hell, all my friends are going to be there. Oh, you have no idea what you just said. Amen. Amen. Uh, two things are going on there. Number one, all of the friends that they have also don't, love, don't, don't want to get right with God. And secondly, they have no idea what hell is. Amen. Mm -hmm. And so that's a sad part, and that's the church's fault. You know, the church is afraid to even mention hell. The church is afraid to even mention hell anymore. Jesus taught, preached about hell more than any other Bible character. And the horrors of hell must be preached. And I, know I don't preach on it often as I should, but the horrors of hell should be preached. Amen. Since when has hell become so mundane as to compare hell with the sufferings of this life? It's not even comparable. Hebrews 10, 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 2 Timothy 3, 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Turn away from such people. 
The youth of this generation have been taught about the angry white man. The careless generation of pollution-happy, global warming-causing, ozone-depleting, tree-cutting, rainforest-destroying, homosexual-hating, intolerant, judgmental, religious hypocrites that are all adults that came before them. They are the only righteous. They believe that I am all of those things as a born-again Christian, giving birth to the environmentalist and gay pride and the emo and the god. Emotional wrecks, but, but fixing all the wrongs that we perpetrated and saving the planet and accepting those poor born with it. And the deviance and the list goes on and on and on. Amen. But it is the born-again Christian's in this generation that are evil. That's where the justification is going to come. Soon. Where they're going to start rounding us up. You are evil. The Bible talks about renounce Christ and take the mark or you won't eat bread. You won't be able to eat. What happens when you have to get Label, right? For, let's give an example. As far fetched as it might seem, maybe if you get, oh, let's say, I don't know, a vaccination, and you have to have a card or you have to have it marked on you somewhere that you have a vaccination. And if you don't show proof of your vaccination, you can't go into a grocery store. You can't buy something. That's how it starts. Amen. Certainly not how it ends. And so, they feel, this generation, they feel they have a corner on godliness. And their causes are more godly than even the church. And they judge fornication and gossip mongering and texting in church that we just don't have any love and we're surely not, uh, uh, that's not God. But having a form of godliness and desiring the power is killing our generation. Massive <laughs> suicides. Suicides of, among teens is now the second cause of death for teens. Suicide. Teenagers with, that, that are saying this but have so little hope as they're killing themselves in droves. Prescription drug records being set. Uh, opioids. A, Canceling an entire generation, transgender confusion, uh, uh, abortions, and teenagers having babies, and baby mamas, and baby daddies, and it goes on and on. Having a form of godliness but denying the power. Amen. And then, thirdly, as I close, there's the captive heart deception. Quote from a lifelong church kid that is lost and backslidden said, and I quote, just because I'm not serving God the way you are doesn't mean I'm not serving God. What is the way I am? What is that? Just because I'm not serving God. I know you've heard that. Some of you have heard that. Just because I'm not serving God the way you are doesn't mean I'm not serving God. Well, what exactly is the way that I am? Ask that how much calmer I am now than I used to be. <laughs> am I right, brother? Zach knew me as a brand new pastor, 26 years old. Brand new pastor. Amen? I used to preach a lot harder then, didn't I? Oh, yeah. I, you would call me bachelor now for my preaching, huh? Just about. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> my preaching is so nice. Compared to then, I was just fired up. Fired up. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. For of this sort are those who creep into households. They make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away with various lusts. Preaching this new age 
everything is relative gospel to our young. There is a, uh, a growing church movement that doesn't hold any standards. They simply have a concert style, amazing music scene, uh, 15 minutes of I'm okay, you're okay, let's all drink coffee together, and that's it. And that's the church. That's not the church. Amen. If you and I aren't changing, what are we doing? If we're not becoming closer to him, more like his image, Behold, I see through a glass darkly, but then, face to face, I will know as I know it. I don't know about you, but I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. And I don't, I've served God 36 years and I don't believe I'm even yet close. I think there's so much more that God has for me friend of mine was cleaning a swimming pool and he heard the resident say on the phone this quote that is what 21 year olds do they party they sleep together they hang out you need to leave those parents of yours that are crushing you and move out so you can be who you are Does that sound like good advice? No. It only sounds like good advice if you don't care what happens to the person you're talking to. Amen. I happen to care what happens to the person I'm talking to. Amen. I'm going to close with Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointing me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty Jesus. to the captives and recovering sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed are oppressed. My job is to proclaim good news that you don't have to uh, die and go to hell. You don't have to uh, be a victim to this world. Amen. That the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus has, has died for you. Amen. And raised from the dead so you can live a life that is beyond this world. Amen. That you can have an eternity with God. Amen. Yes. And he has sent me to proclaim liberty, that you can be free from drug addiction, that you don't have to be a captive uh, uh, to sins. You don't have to be a slave to sins. Amen. You can be free. You can proclaim. Yes, we can, you can be liberated in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's good. And recovering in sight to the blind, meaning you don't even have to stay sick. You don't have to stay uh, uh, infirmed. Uh, amen. Jesus can heal you by his stripes. We are healed. I can lay hands on you and you can be set free. You can be healed. You can be, you can be made whole. Amen. I've seen people that have diagnosed cancer. Uh, amen. Completely healed where the doctor made them come back six times. Continued to test them. Could not believe that, that a preacher just laid hands on her and all of a sudden the cancer has gone. She went in to get surgery and they couldn't find it. And they said, what's going on? And, and, and so they said, you need to come back next week. We're going to check you again. She came back six times before the doctor said, I don't know if you're right or I don't know if you're wrong, but I can't find the cancer, so I guess you can just not come back. Praise mm -hmm. God. All I did was lay hands on her. Amen. Amen. Recovering sight of the blind, healing those that are sick, to so set at liberty those who are oppressed. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of oppressed people in yes, America, amen. a lot of oppressed people in the world, uh, a lot of people that, that don't feel like they can Jesus. lift their head up because everything is pressing down on them, that Jesus Christ came to set them free, and he made me an ambassador, amen, for his calling to go out and do the same thing. And my job is to change a generation for the good. I'm not the evil white guy. The lies of hell have permeated our society, and you and me, we need to stand for righteousness and Amen. be. We need to be the ambassadors of righteousness to a lost and a dying world, and you have to have a heart for people, for where they're going, for where they're ultimately going to end up. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Jesus loves you. I say those three words every time. I say, bow your heads. 
Every single service for the last nine years in this church, I have said, Jesus loves you. As we bowed our heads and went into a time of prayer. And it seems Sunday night is the night where I get the sermons that seem a little harsher. That I preach to a smaller crowd of mostly people that just come here. Uh, no matter what, uh, amen, because they're dedicated and they're committed. And so you can take it. I can preach that, and, and you, can, you can be a part of that, and you can love that, and you can feel like God is speaking to you. If you're not saved, you're not born again, listen, this, this, your time is short. You have got to make a decision soon enough. I would hate to be the one that's not saved in this generation, in these days, right now, and then even this coming up week is going to be a very chaotic time. Uh, there's uh, right now currently 25,000 military troops in Washington, D.C. with, with uh, miles of fencing and barbed wire. Uh, amen. It is a different America than I've ever seen. But this is where we are. I've never seen America more divided. I've never seen Christianity more hated. I knew it was coming because the Bible proclaims it throughout. Now is the time to get on the right side, church. Now is the time, if you're not saved, to get your heart right. Now is the time to be born again, to live for God. Feel the presence of God permeating your very heart, traveling and coursing through your veins and determining the life you're going to live. The destiny you're going to walk. The transcendent nature of God allows you to walk in a supernatural type of lifestyle. He's not worried about what the world can do with you because the God of heaven keeps you. And it's greater than you're not saved, you're not born again. You'd like to give your life to Jesus. I want you to raise your hand quickly. Walk all through this place right now. And on live stream, wherever you are. Raise your hand, Pastor. Pray for me. I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ. I want to give my heart right. And you put your hand up. We're going to pray this prayer. I want you to say it with me. And if you'll say it, if you'll mean it. With your whole heart, Jesus will set you free. Tonight can be the beginning of something wonderful. I got saved in 1983 and I've never turned back. And here it is, 2021. It's almost unbelievable to me. Let's pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you can save me. I believe you died for me and rose from the dead that I can have eternal life. I ask you to come into my heart to fill me with your spirit, to cleanse me from my sins. I believe that you can change my life and I ask you to give me the power, the wisdom and the strength that I can walk with you on the destiny that you have laid out for me all the remaining days of my life. That I would serve you with my own heart. That you would be my God and I would be your follower. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free, for cleansing me from all sin, and for being my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to close the live stream. Thank you very much for tuning in. Close the live stream to give you an opportunity.